Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I have to read some notes, but honestly, this is the best part of my day. My name is Norm Wilner. I am a programmer here, amazingly, with Digital Releasing and Industry Select, and it is my genuine pleasure to introduce the Canadian premiere of Oliver Hermana's Living. I he can hear you. I would like to thank our lead and major sponsors, Bell, RBC, Bulgari, and Visa for their continued support. Thank you to our major supporters, the Government of Canada, the Government of Ontario, Telefilm Canada, and the City of Toronto for their continued support. This film plays as part of the Contemporary World Cinema Program, which is generously sponsored by Sun Life, and the film is eligible for the People's Choice Award. Vote for your favorite films at tiff.net slash vote. We would like to thank Mongrel Media, Sony Pictures Classics, and Rocket Science for providing us with the film. Uh, Oliver Hermanus was born in Cape Town and worked as a press photographer in South Africa before attending the London Film School in London. We've welcomed his films to the festival before. Shirley Adams, Beauty, and The Endless River have all screened here. And if you haven't seen his 2019 drama, Muffy, I'm sorry, Muffy, I always mispronounce that. Um, I recommend you catch up to that when you get a chance. M-O-F-F-I-E, write it on your hand or something. Uh, tonight, so this afternoon rather, he is back with Living, um, which is a new version of a beloved story. And uh, before I start talking about all of that, I'm just gonna say he can do it better than I can. So ladies and gentlemen, Oliver Hermanus. Thank you. Wow, Toronto, this is my fourth time. Um, we're very happy to be back. I actually showed my very first film here almost 11 or 12 years ago. Uh, that was a really tiny movie from South Africa, and then I showed a slightly bigger one, and then I showed a slightly bigger one, and now I'm back with a pretty big one. Um, you've always been such an inc incredible audience. It's always been such a pleasure to show movies here and talk to the audience, um, so I'm really looking forward to doing that. Um, this has been a really interesting and exciting project for me and for everyone involved. Um, I have to thank Sony Picture Classics for bringing us here to America with this film um, and to Canada, <laughs> not <Awesome>. America. <laughs> um, and I have some people I'd like to introduce you to who might not say anything, but they will be with me when I do the Q&A with them later. And I'd like to introduce our actress, Amy Lou Wood. And, and the man himself, Bill Nye. Um, we really hope we enjoy our film. This is, we'll talk about it when we see you later. You can ask us a bunch of questions. I hope they can ask us. Yes, they can ask us questions. Um, and we'll tell you how it came together and all the amazing people that were involved in making it. Um, and I really hope you enjoy it, so we'll see you in a bit. Thank you. Amy Lou Wood. Thank you. Anywhere you like. And producer Stephen Woolley. Can I have a water? You have my water. Calm um, down. No, you, you feel the love. You sit there and you feel the love from these people. This is, I am very, very happy right now. Uh, this is the kind of film that redefines, I mean, most people when, you, when they hear Bill Nye's name, they think of comic energy, wiry energy, something unpredictable, kind of the way you entered the room. <laughs> the thing he's doing right now, um, I have seen you, uh, we were both in London in 2007 at the BFI Festival and I watched you walk into a party and everyone around you suddenly smiled, just lit up. We didn't get to talk, I wasn't that important, but uh, I'm still not that important. But the, the love that people have for you, this instinctual response to, oh my God, I love him. And to, to turn it all off here is really, it's almost shocking, the, the way that you're introduced in the film. Uh, through the train window, it's as though you're already a ghost. And I know that's part of the, the, the trajectory of the character, but it, you, to watch you come back to life on screen is 
it's exhilarating. And I mean, I, that's, that was my take on it. I'm assuming some of you felt the same way. But. Thank you. But that's the first question, which is, how did the two of you get there? How did you all know you could do this? And at what point, when you're remaking Ikiru into a new texture, into a new world, how do you know, oh, and I want it to be Bill Knight? No, it, <clears throat> excuse me. It really began with um, uh, Ishiguro, who uh, was a big fan of, of Bill's, and um, myself and Ishiguro and Bill had dinner. Um, he had seen a film I produced which showed here in Toronto called Their Finest, and Ishiguro... Oh yeah, okay, let him thank hear you. it. I love that movie. And um, Ishiguro is a big fan of, of 40s and 50s British cinema, as you can imagine. Um, and after the dinner, having that with Bill, he suggested to the two of us separately that perhaps Bill um, might consider being in a version of um, Akiru, which is a Japanese film from 1952, uh, but set in London. And I watched the Akiru again and thought, what a wonderful idea, and said to Ish Ishiguro, you should write it. And he said, oh, no, no, I'm not very good at scripts. I said, no, 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 you'd be good at this script because you know this period and you know the original and you know the characters. So um, after arm wrestling with the Kurosawa estate for a while um, and arm wrestling with Ishiguro, um, he wrote it for Bill. Basically, as simple as that, um, this film was written for for Mr. Nye, and um, it's my third film with Bill. Um, we really had a struggle trying to think of somebody who would be able to direct this, and I saw um, Oliver's uh, uh, movie, Moffy, at the London Film Festival, and if no one has, if you haven't seen Moffy, you have to see it. Yeah. It's a beautiful film. I told them that in the intro. Yeah, well, I'm telling them again, because M -O -F -F -I -E. it's amazing. And it's a film that is about restraint and silence and all of the ingredients that you used to find in movies. It's beautifully shot, beautifully framed, wonderful performances. And I just thought, well, this person and Ishiguro and Bill would be perfect. At that point, that's the point where I really should go home and do nothing, but <laughs> unfortunately, that's when, the, that's when the fun begins. Um, and, and Bill, if I can ask, what was your first response? And were you immediately on board? Or? Uh, my, yeah, my, the, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Uh, my first response was, um, well, I, firstly, I watched Ikuru, and, uh, which I'd never seen. I never watched the films you're supposed to watch. You know what I mean? When people say, what's your favorite film? You're supposed to say, you know, Metropolis. <laughs> I've never seen Metropolis. <laughs> I've seen all the Die Hard movies. <laughs> and everything that Mark Wahlberg's in. <laughs> Which is, you know. It's uh, a wide range. Thank you. And, uh, but uh, yeah, so I watched the Kurai, I admired that. I mean, I, you know, it's like I was very, very good in a previous life. You know, uh, a, the, one of the most eminent writers in the world suggests that you might be in a film, and then he actually agrees to write it with you in mind. And with Stephen Woolley, who is, you know, a great film producer, who's a great colleague of mine, and then to meet Oliver, who, as you've seen tonight, turned in something absolutely exquisite and beautiful and powerful. <laughs> Um, who was uh, who was very 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 good with me and you know and he, he and he guided me through it in a, an impeccable manner and uh, and then to work with Amy Lou this is not PR this is all for real um, uh, you know who was absolutely wonderful to work with she was the one and only please <laughs> she was the one and only actor that was ever considered for this role. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it was the, everything about the project was attractive, you know, and it's a wonderful part. And I also, because it was about, um, it was about, you know, it, 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 procrastination. I procrastinate at an Olympic level. <laughs> I challenge anyone in the room. <laughs> I can put shit off forever. <laughs> 
And uh, it's kind of what I'm good at. It's how I spent my youth. My youth was dedicated th to, you know, missing stuff, not doing. I was in a little gang of people who didn't do stuff. <laughs> people would come in and say, did you do the thing? And they would go, what thing? You know, it was like, because we were so cool. Um, but uh, so, yeah, but anyway, I elaborate too much. But, uh, and, but to be in a movie where, where, about a man who works in an institution, what interests me is that the tendency to procreate, which is presumably fearful, uh, can be expressed societally in a massive great building that they build for the purpose and fill with people, uh, an institution designed to prevent stuff from happening. <laughs> it's what, you know, it's what governments do largely, you know. Um, it's a big part of their gig. Um, so I'm very, I'm fascinated by that. And I'm also fascinated by what's called Englishness, although I'm sure there are characters like Mr. Williams in every country in the world. But it's associated with us. And that degree of restraint and reserve, almost to the point of madness, where you're supposed to apologize for dying. You know, sorry to be so much trouble. Sorry, you know, which is literally what people would say, you know. Um, and I, and I, was born, I would have been one of those kids in the playground, you know. I, you know, it's weird when you look at black and white footage and you think, that's really a long time ago. And then you remember, I was there, you know. <laughs> so uh, I, would have been, I would have been wearing those shorts in the playground. So the whole thing was uh, very... Uh, w w I'm fascinated by all of that stuff. And, and since you mentioned Amy Lou, I'm going to jump right in. Uh, also, while Hello. I'm recommending things for people to watch, uh, she plays Sonia in a production of Uncle Vanya. Uh, went out in 2020, I think, just but as the pandemic started. I happened to catch it on iTunes. Uh, it's splendid, and you are remarkable. And you know, sex education's great, but you're Sonia. Thank you. We Thank were talking you. about this before. If anyone's seen it, that these the Chekhov is a window into actor souls, and somehow you do it. Julianne Moore did it in Vanya on 42nd Street. It's just, yeah. it's, it's remarkable. Here, you. you are not in Chekhov, no. but. Uh, you are alive, like as a contrast to literally everyone around you. You're active, you're, your eyes are wide, and you're doing things all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, even if she's not where she wants to be, yeah. she has an optimistic f outlook that there will be an assistant manager's position. You're just waiting tables for the moment. Hello. And Bless her. <laughs> <laughs> is that, I mean, how do you, how do you match a vacancy that the the thing that Bill is putting out there, which is just sort of non-reactive. He's he's very polite. He's very kind, but you're not interacting for the first hour of the film until the connection yeah. is made. Yeah, and it and it really that first time that Mr. Williams says, "Oh, I hear you're leaving us," you know, in my head that was the first time he's ever really spoken to me or seen me. Like we were, I was saying this a while ago, but they they've looked at each other, but they haven't seen each other until this film. And until he, you know, until he knows that he's not got long left and he sees this person who he thinks personifies life, which she does not see in herself. She just thinks she's, you know, just a person. But I just think that's so beautiful that when two people connect and they really truly see each other and they see each other for more than they see themselves is just such a special thing. And it's like the best thing in life is when you connect with someone like that. And they both, yeah, they do that for each other as well. It's definitely mutual. Um, but yeah, I think she's just very, I just love about her that she's so in her own experiences. I think it can be so easy to think about how you're being received in life instead of how you actually feel. And I think she, in that office, you know, she knows that moving to Lions Corner House isn't probably as respectable and impressive a job but she doesn't like the office so she just moves and I find that quality just so admirable that she does things for herself and she she knows when she needs to get out of somewhere and and change it and I think that's what Mr. William sees in her is this kind of this courage even though it's on such a small scale and that's what I love about the film we, we talk about this you know people are watching it and it's all about just a little playground but it is this you know, the small things in life that are so beautiful. And I think that's that little act of courage of Margaret going, no, this place is going to crush me. So I'm going to go and be a waitress and hope one day I'll be an assistant manager. But at least I'm not there. And even if it goes wrong, it's fine. I'll try something else. And I think that's just a really brave way to be. Yeah, well, especially for the 1950s when that wasn't expected of women. I'm sorry, and I stepped on your applause. <laughs> go for it. Thank you. 
it is, it's, it's interesting, and I wanted to ask about this as well, uh, to set the story when the original film takes place is sort of, uh, it's not like a, a challenge to the audience exactly, because there are, I'm, I'm sure there are thousands, if not millions of potential viewers who've just never even seen the original or even heard of it, but you are setting yourself the challenge of recreating a period in, in British history that is markedly different. You know, England is recovering from being the victims and Japan is recovering, was recovering from being, you know, defeated. Mm -hmm. So the, the mentality is very, very different in the story. And I know, you know, Ishiguro is too smart not to let that go. But there are elements in the film visually too that tell us that things are slowly coming back. But you know, the, the playground is a cesspool. It's, it's presumably a bomb site, right? I mean, this is from the Blitz. And that's how we watch one man help an entire uh, nation recover in his tiny way. But yeah. how do you approach that, Oliver, visually? I mean, how do you tell that story? Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry, they hired a former <laughs> critic. Um, I think, well, I, mean, I think the reason why Stephen was sort of curious about me perhaps was that I wasn't from the United Kingdom, from England. So my attitude and my approach to, to, to telling the story would be as an outsider of some kind um, and would be kind of focused very much on research and, uh, and cinema. And uh, Ishiguro was inc extraordinary in sending me a lot of movies. Um, and and I, we were in lockdown, so I was in South Africa and they were in England. And so I, I, I became sort of fascinated and it, it, you, I always knew that the importance of the setting of our story was that we had to tell the story of London being very much just outside of the war. Um, so we had to have some kind of visual reference of that and of course the, 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 the cesspool and the, the building of the playground is what becomes the sort of very visual part of it. But then at the same time I also wanted it to be a film, so I wanted it to be kind of a little bit romantic so that you know, our office, for example, is completely, the walls are black. I mean, I, I, our production designer, Helen Scott, is honestly extraordinary. And um, she, yeah, she deserves a round of yeah, applause, definitely. Um, and I, I said to her, look, I really want everything to be black and white. I want the walls to be black. And I said to our uh, also extraordinary costume designer, Sandy Powell. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> Um, I said that I want the walls to be black, and I said to Sandy, but I also want all the men to be in black, and I said the only thing in white that I want to have is Amy. So in that office, everyone's in shades of black and gray and blue, the walls are black, and Amy wears white shirts, and so she stands out as the, as the object of interest, or the, the sort of l the sunshine, as I was referred to, the character of Margaret. Um, but that's not necessarily period correct. That's just trying to make an interesting visual film. And then my f the collaborator, my director of photography, also deserves a round of applause. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was good. I, I can't <laughs> because I have to hold my dress. Um, you know, <laughs> telling him that the whole set was going to be black and everyone's going to be wearing black and the only other color was white. He was like, are you kidding? Like, <laughs> <laughs> how do I light that? You know, black sucks up all the light and then the highlight is her costume. So. You know, it was a challenge, but I think that it, it was my way of interpreting the cinema and the research and, and my outsider's point of view. Of course, that makes sense. Um, we have a couple of minutes for some questions from the audience. Uh, gentlemen up front and then in the back. I'll repeat that. Uh, both Ikiru and Living are films that are very much set in a time and place a specific time and place, do you think that this story could be told now? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Next question. Um, yeah, no, I, uh, I absolutely do. I think it's, you, uh, you know, it's timeless. People have been pro procrastinating probably in caves, <laughs> you know, tomorrow. Uh, and people have been frightened to death since they first heard about it, as I was. Uh, and uh, therefore, I don't think it would suffer uh, uh, any, any being transposed to any period ever. I think, uh, and, and also, uh, you know, the institutions in England haven't changed that much in terms of, you know, what I mean, they just don't wear bowler hats anymore. But you know, uh, yes, please, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, our, our, our composer also deserves a round of applause. <laughs> uh, 
Um, it's our, our score is a combination of things. I mean, it's a combination of things that were inspirations when I was preparing. I sort of had a playlist that we kept going, and the the piece at the very end in the playground is a piece by Vaughan Williams, which was something that I actually had sort of started with at the very beginning, and then. Emily, our composer, kind of took inspiration from those things. And so it's a real mix of things and uh, always a bit of rule breaking with the period and uh, being a bit sort of melodramatic in places. Um, it's, the, it's the kind of score where you always go, people are either going to go, whoa, that's too much or well, that's a bit big. Um, but it felt, it felt right for this movie to just be a little bit ballsy and, and, and we mixed it in a way that's a bit loud, so that's also good. And there was someone way up at the back earlier Great. Uh, one more uh, pink shirt. Uh, obviously, you two were terrific, but I want to ask about the other cast members. Yes. yes. Also, a round of applause. <laughs> Amazing. This is uh, a question about the rest of the cast. Um, this is a yeah. This is a this is a real sort of testament to the absolute ex extraordinary talent of, of British acting. Uh, and I, I think I'm safe to say that everyone had a good time working together, and it was a. Uh, they had fun. I know they had a lot of fun, especially when they were around that that desk, because <laughs> <laughs> they were there for a week around that desk. And so I think that was always good. It was good for everyone to get to know each other. But you know, it was just a joy, a really absolute joy, to work w with this cast, and an absolute joy to find this cast and to go through the process. Um, and you know, I, I actually, to be honest, not many of them have seen it, so I can't wait to show it to them. To be honest, I mean, Oliver shot the scene in the carriage with four men wearing bowler hats for quite a long time. And I think uh, it, the, the, the incredible performances they give in those flashback sequences are amazing for those four. And Tom Burke, the actor who plays Sutherland, just brings a certain other sense of eccentricity to the film that was so needed. Um, now, Oliver did an incredible job with the actors. And I have to say, despite all of the problems of shooting that every production has, uh, has every single one of those actors gave, thanked me at the end for one of the best experiences they've ever had and that is t truly down to the director yeah. thank you Stephen yeah. and the catering and, and the catering I'm sorry sir you've had your hand up we'll do one last question Yeah, they. <laughs> the film, the film is going to close the Tokyo Film Festival, and um, the Kurosawa State really loved the film. So, but then, um, yeah. So we I'm. I, that, that's a. That, I think that might be news to some of the people on the stage. Actually, um, they really liked it, and um, they only this week they decided that they would like Toho, who released the original film, are also releasing the film in Japan. And it's closing the Tokyo Film Festival. So, thank you. Uh, and on that note, bef before we close, uh, Bill, you had said you must have been very good in a previous life. You're pretty good in this one. So, yeah. once again, I love when I get to do this. Bill Nye, Oliver Hermanis, Amy Lou Wood, Stephen Woolley, let them hear it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you all.